Dan Simon's on the phone. He's in the Middletown office. You can always reach him at 888-690-8820. You want to talk to him. doesn't charge anything to talk to you. 888-690-8820. I love these guys. They've done great work for me. Dan, thanks for being on. What's up? My pleasure, Rick. How are you today? Good, good. So, you know, quite often uh, we, we talk about inflation and the fact that every financial product has a uh, has an attribute to solve problems and such. Right now, it seems like everything is a problem. It's certainly like, not like the go-go years of past. So, um, yeah, I'd like to have a, a dialogue on uh, some of the risks that you see in retirement, stock market, guaranteed accounts, things like that. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I wanted to start out and just thank Willis Carrier. Do you know who Willis Carrier is, Rick? He invented the uh, air conditioner in 1902, and I think we should all be grateful for Willis Carrier before we jump in. Thank you, Willis Carrier, hence the Carrier Air Conditioner. You got it, right? We love you, Willis! (laughs) And the Freon with which it brings. All right. You got it, right? So, yeah, when we we talk about things a lot and, you know, different financial products, I I do. I believe all financial products have different attributes to solve problems. That's yeah, of course. What the goal is, just like the air conditioner, was to solve the problem of a, a very hot northeastern summer, right? Exactly. And, um, and by the but, way, speaking of technology, we have all kinds of technology that solves uh, certain problems. Like, for example, speaker phones are great if you're running around doing something. Uh, but then again, broadcasting on the air, I find actually holding the handset uh, seems to be a, a fine solution for broadcast communication. Just to, I just want to tie that in with what you're saying. Not to, I just picked up my my headset. If that sounds better, I didn't want to be too. Tip. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to be too snarky about it, but I, I wanted to sort of laughingly uh, join in on what you're saying because honestly, this sounds a lot better. Thank you, sir. No problem. Smarter than I look. <laughs> uh, so you know, I was I was coming. I came across something I read the other day. It was a report that was put out by um, it was uh, Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania in regards to. You know, retirement and improving someone's uh, you know likelihood for a secure and, and successful retirement, uh, and it was all the you know kind of designed around income because uh, again when we think about retirement it's it's replacing lost income from when when individuals were working yeah and you know the the first avenue is always social security and um, you know it's designed with replacement rates and in, in, in taken into consideration where. Social Security is going to replace more income for a lower income earner than it will for a high income earner. That's that's just basic fact. Um, but about 70 percent of pre-retirement income is considered sufficient by this study. Um, it's considered know, what? Continue, sufficient. Sufficient. Right? So okay. if someone's making, uh, let's just say, $100,000 a year, they should have $70,000 of income coming in in retirement. Okay. Um, but the reality is Social Security only replaces approximately 40% of the average retiree's uh, income while they're working, right? So there's a, you know, about a, a 30% gap there as to, well, how do we solve that gap and create the additional income? And when I was reading this, I was thinking, well, this might be something good to talk about on the radio today because – when we think about income in retirement, it's derived from multiple sources. Uh, those sources could be, obviously, one, Social Security, two, if you're fortunate, you have a pension, uh, three, could be part-time work, and, and four, is leveraging other assets that you've accumulated o- over the course of your working career. And that's really where it kind of backpedals into, well, what financial products are we using to solve that problem of the income gap. Well, the other uh, thing, too, is you might have some assets you want to leverage for income, and they don't work out. For example, I, I thought that I could just leverage my kid. And uh, <laughs> say, here, now now you can support me. Give me. It's not working. Yeah, it's, it's not working out. Like, give me money. No, it's not working. <laughs> Yeah, they, I, I look at those as expensive. My kids are younger than yours, but they're yeah. expenses at this point. We're investments. One well done. Another, right? Yeah, I, I think mine's an investment um, just to get her out of the house. But other than that, she's, yeah, so, she's great. She's great, yes. You know, when, when we look back and say, okay, so we've got these assets now, and I'm, I'm talking about investable assets, of course, of course and – you know, is the stock market the ideal solution for income in retirement? Maybe for a portion, but for all of it, does an individual want to have all of their assets that they're relying on to, to supplement that income gap tied to the stock market? And, 
you know, from my experience and the clientele that we work with, the answer to that is usually no. You know, I don't want to risk everything to yeah. rely on the income for it. Well, if uh, I may, there's another thing, too, because it is all about income. And right now, and we've talked about this before, Dan, the interest rates. For example, you, uh, someone's trying to buy a house at 7% or more at a loan, and like, oh, my gosh, it's terrible. Yet somebody who's retired could be getting, say, uh, four and a quarter percent in a money market or maybe five and, and a quarter percent on a money market, depending upon where you go. And they're saying, wow, that's fantastic. And then you look at, for example, dividend stocks. Well, and this is my question. Why would you want to be in a dividend stock that's paying, say, um, 5% per quarter when you're in even a money market that's got 5% per month? You know what I mean? And sure. it, so it, it all depends. You you really have to have the growth in that particular company to justify mm -hmm. uh, the lower dividend, the, any dividends lower than, than, the, uh, than the interest. And and that's the dicey part because right now, I mean, there's a handful of stocks, that, mostly tech stocks, that are driving the market. It seems it's not like you can just go and say, "Oh, I'm going to buy this utility. I'm going to go and uh, and buy this uh, stock that might be good in AI," and and see great revenues. Rick, you're exactly right, and uh, I believe it was Bank of America just released a, um, a report recently that was kind of digging into the returns of the S&P 500, and they're calling it the uh, the S&P 493, excluding the Magnificent Seven, which is you know the, the AI stocks, tech stocks that have been really been carrying. Uh, that specific index, which a lot of people view as, quote, unquote, the market. Yeah. Um, but their research basically showed that the 493 other companies have been in an earnings growth recession since 2022. Right. <laughs> Where, you know, the, the seven stocks have been, hey, you know, everything looks well and great. But if you're not specifically in those stocks or in a, a pure S&P 500 fund, then you're probably not experiencing the, the results of that fund, if that makes sense. So, yes, where the dividend may be the same as something that's coming off of a, a secured vehicle, like a money market, like a savings account or a CD, that offers you the principal protection. There's the volatility that's associated with those, those dividend-paying stocks as well. Well, traditionally, they, they seem to be less volatile, but there's still the probability or possibility that they could go down in value. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you don't talk about specific specific stocks and things like that. You're not allowed to, but I can. Correct. And, and, I'll, and I'll say that uh, I, had, I owned Coca-Cola for many, many years. And it was nice because I got a dividend during uh, those years when interest rates were near zero. Mm -hmm. But but now, but I sold it because I don't see person. I could be wrong. I could be wrong about this, but I don't see Coca Cola specifically as being much of a growth stock. Now, something could happen over the next week or two, and I could be wrong about that. That's fine. So I did sell that, and I did put that in a money market, trying to figure out. Okay, well, if I'm going to be in the market with this particular amount of money, what am I going to do? And and I haven't found anything that's. Uh, extraordinarily attractive. I, I know I have some friends uh, who also invest, and I do too, and we talk to each other, probably listen to the show right now, and they know that I've invested in you know, one company, Archer Daniels Midland, just because they screwed up. Uh, they had to fire their, what, CFO and, uh, and another guy. But it's, it's a good company. But you have to be so into the details uh, of these companies and then also be hopeful that something's going to be coming back as well. So as you do get closer to retirement, we do think about these things. And even within like 10 years, 15 years of retirement, many of us uh, have changed our investment strategies. I just wanted to say that in response to what you were saying. Absolutely. The, the strategy changes, the appetite for risk changes, the tolerance for loss changes, and the objective changes. Right, because while you're in that that accumulation phase while you're working, the goal is to to grow it, build it, grow it, build it, and then yeah, you, know, you get kind of to where I was when we started talking here. It's saying, all right, well, how do we turn this into income now? Yeah, right, and that's that's the it's it's the first time people really think about that because. You know, from my experience, the majority of, uh, you know, an individual's expenditures, right, what they're, they're pying and what they're, what they're spending money on usually is derived from 
their income, right, what they make a year, as opposed to depleting a, a, a savings account, maybe for a big purchase, such as a home or a car or something like that. But, mm-hmm. you know, the day-to-day expenses are typically covered by the paycheck. And, you know, if, if Social Security is only covering roughly 40%, uh, you know, we need to come up with that, that delta, that gap, right, to get to where you need to be. Uh, and, you know, our risky assets, such as the market, the ideal solution for that? And many would argue no. Um, it's, it's designed to be a piece of, of the solution, you know, perhaps a, a hedge for that, that dreaded I word we're all dealing with right now, inflation. You know, because when you think about it, yeah, sure, you know, you read the, the financial reports and the markets are doing great, the markets are doing great, but talk to the people around you, talk to the people in the community. How's Main Street doing these days? True. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think it, yeah. it's been a, a, a you know, a, a rapid ascent on both sides of, of the page, you know, where, yeah, sure, the markets and Wall Street have all done great. But, you know, I think the average folks out there uh, are struggling because inflation's real. It hasn't gone away and it, it impacts the bottom line for everyone these days. So how do you stay ahead of that? Uh, planning. <laughs> I, th- yeah, I think well, planning, yeah. um, stress testing your retirement plan, you know, you know, I can run reports for people in, in that, that we prepare all the time, and you know, numbers look great if you don't put in inflation, and then if you factor in inflation, it's oh boy, you're going to run out of money when you're, you know, 80 years old. Let me ask. Uh, let me let me ask you a question about that because right now, according to the nonpartisan Bureau of Labor Statistics, inflation since January of 2021 is at 20 percent, 20 percent. And yet we also know in that same period of time that groceries, the cost of groceries overall, that that whole basket, is anywhere from 30 to 35 percent more than it was before. So as you t- take a look at the, the monthly numbers, oh, okay, 3.4 percent inflation, 3.5 percent inflation. If you're projecting this out for somebody, what numbers do you use? We typically use a 3% rate for inflation. Uh, I think that's a, a fair and reasonable number. Mm-hmm. Um, but the important thing is when, you know, when we run our analysis and, you know, quote unquote, diagnostics on someone's retirement plan, you've got to take into consideration what expenses are fixed and what expenses are variable. Obviously, if someone's locked into a, a mortgage and you know it's going to be paid off in, in 15 years, we've got to run principal and interest at a fixed rate. Um, you know, but the majority of other expenses are variable and likely going up in the future. I mean, your, your example with the, the food costs and, you know, how that have changed over the last three years. I, I think about a, a morning a few weeks ago, running a little bit late for a meeting. I hadn't had anything to eat. I stopped in at McDonald's and just grabbed a, a breakfast sandwich, a coffee, and a hash brown. I think it was $9.50. I'm like, uh, when did this happen? I know, right? It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. This happen? And, and by the way, traditionally, running inflation at 3% is pretty conservative. That's There's nothing wrong with that. We didn't see what was going to happen with the pandemic. Certainly didn't think that there's going to be so much federal government spending is starting in 2021 as, as there has been uh, or even back in 2020, you know, because of uh, the pandemic, but it didn't, uh, many of us were hoping that there wouldn't be as much spending going on in 2021. Tragically there is. And even more spending of billions of dollars, because that is indeed what causes inflation, the creation of money that we don't have, especially. And so, that's why I was, I was wondering, you know, what number do you use? And that is a reasonable number to use because right now we're a little higher than that benchmark, but not Currently. dramatically. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a historical average, but you it know, is. the old saying, the problem with the problem with averages are what average. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the other thing too. Uh, I mean, what if you did, because it, it is, uh, it's a combination of, uh, of history and then, um, computing. So history and then futuristic computing. So what happens if you do say, okay, we're going to run this higher, like four, four and a half percent? Well, you know, a couple of things. I mean, expenses are obviously when you extrapolate them out over a, a longer period of time, they're just going to get higher and higher and higher. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I do believe that 3% is reasonable over the course of someone's uh, retirement and whether it's a 25-year period of time on average. Um, you know, to run it at 3% on variable expenses. But, you know, the other thing that we're very cognizant about is, 
you know, three percent, I believe, is reasonable on the inflation side of things. But being very cautious on on how we run a rate of return number across someone's assets. Yeah. Um, you know, if you you say, all right, well, you know, the the market averaged eight percent. Well, let's run it at eight. Well, if that doesn't happen, then you know, who who's to blame, right? Um, so we're we're much more cautious when we we run the rate of return across someone's investments. Uh, but I do believe three percent is a, a realistic expectation. Um, you know, when you consider expenses over the course of, uh, you know, a retirement. By the way, that's, I want you to know, I was in the business for about five years um, selling 401k plans, business to business, and mm-hmm. and we would often run 8% back, but this is back in the 1990s. So sure. that, that was a whole different game back then. If you were going to be really, really conservative, you run at 6%. Now, running at 3%, that, that kind of makes sense there as, as well. Um so what is happening in the real world with folks who've been planning, for example, in the past, running at 6%, 8%, and now talking with you and saying, well, you know, you're running at 3 or 4%. What, what, what is happening in the real world? Well, in the in the real world, uh, conversations that I'm having with people these days, it's they're not concerned uh, about, hey, you know, the S&P was up 25% or whatever it was, right? Yeah. And, you know, oh, I, I didn't get the 25%, right? The concern that I'm hearing in the real world right now is, hey, I've got what we've got. Yeah. And we want to make sure we hold on to this and, you know, can continue to live the lifestyle that we've grown accustomed to. And we don't want to run out of money because when we think about the, the five big risks that I see people face day to day, uh, it's market risk, it's inflation, it's taxes, it's healthcare risk and longevity. Yeah. I mean, those are the five big ones. Um, so it's it's not necessarily, hey, I didn't outperform the market. It's, hey, this is what we have. This is the number that we've got to work off of. You know, how do we, you know, tailor a plan to meet our objectives and, you know, really er- eradicate the concerns and the challenges that we have going forward? Yeah, today, uh, uh, Dan, so- uh, by the way, folks, if you just tuned in, it's Dan Simon. He's a financial planner specializing in uh, retirement income with Dan White and Associates. Every Wednesday after uh, 1.30, I have a conversation with Dan or somebody else with the company. And and I was thinking about this the other day. I was thinking about uh, back in the day, you'd laugh by seeing an RV or a, an SUV with a bumper sticker that says, I'm spending, no, we, we are spending our kids' inheritance. And, and I <laughs> thought, yeah, right? I thought, that's pretty funny. I remember those things. And I thought, but no one thinks, well, very few people think that way anymore. Because now, uh, concerns are Social Security may not even be here in 2035. They may tax your Social Security benefits even more so starting in 2035 or maybe even sooner. And uh, they're going to raise the age of retirement. They'll have to do that and, and, and other things. I'm hearing from a lot more people that they don't want to spend down any of the principal at all concerned that, well, Social Security could get slashed 21% easily in uh, the year 2034, 2035. Other things could happen. I, I'm not seeing those bumper stickers anymore, Dan. <laughs> I'm really not. I, I'm not either. I mean, that's that's a concern for the younger generation, right? They're going to have to work for it. <laughs> wow. Well done. All right, man. And I know you're working for it as well. But, no, these are good things to talk about, good information. How do you want to wrap hey, this up? Not not as hard as the folks out, that are outside working today. So, again, thank you, Willis Carrier, and uh, everybody that is outside there in the, uh, in the heat. Find some shade, drink some water, and uh, hopefully this heat wave's by us sooner rather than later. You did the research. You looked that up. You brought it to the show, and I looked this up. Uh, Willis H. Carrier, from 1902 to 1915, was chief engineer of the Buffalo Forge Company. The Buffalo Forge Company. There you go. And... Uh, and there you go. So that's the guy invented the air conditioner. And uh, that's really nice of you to think about the folks working outside there, Dan. Dan Simon with Dan White and Associates. Give him a call at 888-69. Or, uh, wait, 888. Now I forgot uh, the, the phone. Go ahead, you finish it. I'm having a moment. I know, I know our normal number. You got the what is it? Number. That's fine. We got it. We got to roll well, here, in, here in Delaware, it's 302-449-0111. Very good. Well done. And then uh, Dan White's show here on WDEL on uh, Sunday mornings on the money at 7 a.m. Keep it here for Delaware's Afternoon News.